Welcome to episode 35 of the Non-Fungibles podcast. I'm Luke. And I am George. And today we welcome Bruno from Remark, which is NFT Lego on the Kusama blockchain that gives infinite extensibility to its NFTs. Bruno is deeply rooted within the Web3 and Polkadot ecosystems and runs .leap.com with its fortnightly newsletter on everything Polkadot, Substrate and Kusama. We cover so much mind-bending NFT brain food in this episode, you'd better find somewhere safe to sit down. Welcome to the Non-Fun Gerbils podcast, the show about digitally scarce gerbils, non-fungible assets, and the growing decentralized economy. We are the So welcoming to the podcast, we've got Bruno Schwartz. Thank you so much for joining us from the Remark NFT project. We're really excited to hear about this. Obviously, you know, we spend a bit of our time in the Polkadot and Kusama world, but not generally for NFTs as yet. We're just sort of watching those two worlds emerge. It's very exciting. But I guess before we get to that and and what Remark is, it would just be yeah, fantastic to hear a bit about your background with Web3 and how you've ended up where you are now. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. I'm a Ethereum OG. I started in Web 2.0, developed websites for a while, got sick of it when I heard about Ethereum, moved over immediately. I quit all my web development jobs and just focused on learning about Ethereum for a year. Before moving into education, I tried to get as many of my Web 2.0 colleagues over into Web 3 so that they could start building. That was that was pretty great because Solidity was in many ways simple, easy to ship with, Really fast to ship with, powerful, but also easy to get wrong. Much like my other favorite language and environment, Flash, in which I started in the early 2000s, where you had this wonderful ability to combine animation and code in a very understandable and and fluent way. So building games and applications was a real pleasure back then. And I kind of felt that with Solidity when I was writing contracts. A few... Side projects, projects, educational efforts later, I uh, went to work with Status on their side project Nimbus, which is a node for Ethereum 2.0. I joined them as a technical writer. And later on, after a while there, I went to the Web3 Foundation to basically do the same thing, but for Kusama and Polkadot. I was a technical educator there. It's essentially when you're a technical educator, you just copy paste knowledge from from one person's head to another person's head. You just kind of filter it in between so that it's understandable to the to the target audience that's basically it it was it was there that i kind of joined the kusama cult kusama is the canary network for the polkadot chain so i mean it started as the canary network for the polkadot chain like a chain with with economic value that you can test new features on and see how it works and then maybe some of those would go into polkadot later on and that canary chain just moves four times faster in terms of governance, in terms of decision making and everything. But it kind of evolved in its own direction, became its own thing, grew its own cult. And it got this, this nice cypherpunky artsy focus where I felt that the, the Usenet <laughs> spirit in a way, and it felt kind of free to be on, on Kusama. And so I felt like it would be a shame if Kusama as, as an artsy chain missed out on the NFT craze. Uh, when it was starting up. So I started Remark, which is the NFT protocol on Kusama natively before there were parachains. Because if there were parachains at the time, I would have launched on a parachain probably. There were no parachains, so I I had to launch on Kusama natively because otherwise we would have missed the boat on it. And the main aim of these protocols, uh, Polkadot and Kusama, just sort of from a 40,000 foot view, is this sense of interoperability and bringing chains together and allowing them to communicate. And so because of that, some some people consider the sort of the Polkadot and Kusama chains as a sort of layer zero, and they're a bed on which people can build smart contract chains or other application layers. Because of that, one gets the sense that the, the NFT world in those chains has a potentially a very bright future because of that interoperability but also the fact that the primitives need to get built can you tell us a little bit about sort of where things are currently just sort of nfts generally on those systems and then perhaps a little bit on why those systems are interesting to build on in because everyone will sort of understand you know the ethereum nft space and maybe just give a picture on the, on the difference between those 
so right now there are different flavors of NFTs popping up. Remark, the protocol that I, I built is very much a hack on Kusama where it's not smart contract based or logic based. So it's interpreting block graffiti to, to see NFTs where there are no NFTs, basically. Um, it works similar to colored coins from Bitcoin back in the day. And it works well. But it has certain downsides that we're trying to get around by relaunching stuff on other chains now that they are connected to Kusama. Then there's the option of Moon River, which is a, basically a carbon copy of Ethereum, only without the state. So it's a, it's, a, it's a blank slate Ethereum, but it's an Ethereum that is already proof of stake and that has on-chain governance. So if you launch on Moon River, you're kind of launching on Ethereum 1.7. This is obviously has a great deal of appeal to existing Ethereum projects because they can literally just copy paste their code over. And when they do, their code is secured by the shared security of Polkadot or Kusama. So in this case, Kusama, which means they don't have to bother with getting a community around their project. They don't have to bother with building a validator set and everything else that you would uh, have to build if you're building your own chain. You get to inherit the same tools that you've used in Ethereum, but you get a brand new cheap blockchain that is very easy to work with because you're already used to it. And that is already connected to a wider ecosystem of other chains, which granted are not functional yet, but when they activate their full functionality, then you will be able to talk to them through Kusama. And so essentially you're kind of extending every chain that connects to Kusama exponentially grows the feature set because it makes its features available to every other already connected chain, which is kind of cool. So whereas in Ethereum, we have one-on-one -on -one bridges like Bitcoin to Ethereum and back, and this needs its own incentive layer, its own validators that are keeping this bridge alive. On Kusama, Kusama itself is a multi, uh, it's an M2M -M bridge, like many-to-many -many bridge where you have one validator set securing all of this. And so every chain can very easily connect to this ecosystem without its own validator set and with, at the same time, inheriting every other chain's features, which is pretty powerful. So Moon River is, uh, is obviously a very appealing target for NFTs because you can just copy-paste OpenSea over and it works. You can copy-paste any NFT project over, it works. However, no EVM chain in the world is able to handle advanced NFT use cases because no EVM chain in the world is optimized for storing NFT data. Anything on Ethereum, any standard on Ethereum is essentially a hack as well, where you just write the spreadsheets of different complexity and spreadsheets are just bunches of text data. And so if you interact with an NFT on Ethereum, you're modifying text data. Text data is very expensive to change and store. And so this is why even uh, an empty and unused EVM chain will be very expensive to use long term when you're interacting with an NFT regularly. So this is where the application specific nature of substrate chains can come into play where chains can build their own very very specific solutions to very very specific problems but still be compatible with wider ecosystem of kusama and this is where platforms like unique network come into play unique network is an nft chain that is built on the substrate framework which is the framework that powers all of the polkadot and kusama ecosystem only they have optimized their runtime code for some nft functionality that's storage that's free transactions for users, so users don't have to pay gas to interact with NFTs or to mint uh, or to trade or to list for sale. And the ability for NFTs to contain fungible tokens and some other things as well. And so you have this chain that's optimized for NFT usage being deployed to Kusama and thereby being connected to all the other ecosystems as, as well. One of the first chains to integrate Remark logic. So once we convert our logic to palettes, it is actually going to be unique. So they're going to be augmenting their feature set with our feature set that we develop in our palettes. They'll just plug them in and then we'll have basically a native chain with Remark functionality that is optimized for that use case. Uh, another target is just a jerry-rigged basic NFTs. So like the same thing you have on Ethereum. So just a framework for images, really, what NFTs are on Ethereum right now. So those, this has been jerry-rigged into a lot of different chains. Karura has a very simple implementation of NFTs that does just that, stores images uh, and some other chains. They did this as a patch before a uh, more advanced structure is available. So before we can develop the palettes for Remark, they've used this simple approach. And there's also uh, StateMine, which is the common good public parachain on Kusama. This is the first parachain that connected to Kusama. Uh, it being public good means it ha doesn't have to pay for 
um, a parachain slot. It's always included. It's for free. Doesn't have to rent a slot with auctions, and so it's always there which makes it very useful for a canonical balance tracker. So if you have a project that has tokens for that project's economy, it is usually healthier for it to launch the token on StateMine because if the project disappears or gets evicted from the relay chain, from the perishing slot, then your tokens no longer basically exist. Whereas with StateMine, you have this canonical place where all the tokens have tracked their balances and where this chain is optimized for tracking balances and all the other logic can live on the chain separately. StateMine is also the chain that has the Unix palette built in. That's, that's a piece of logic that allows the chain to host primitive NFTs in the style of Ethereum, so just images, uh, image-based NFTs. And so now this is not in, in really widespread use yet. There's only one UI implementation out there, and that's our singular marketplace that can read these NFTs from StateMine. These are just plain images. There's no trading functionality on StateMine, so you can't really sell or buy these these NFTs, they're just there for, you know, like collectibles that you would have to uh, trade through a centralized intermediary like you have to on Ethereum. So like if you would have to have an OpenSea that will basically approve its own wallet to transfer that NFT out of your custody into the buyer's custody and so on, like just like on OpenSea. So these are the different targets. The StateMind Unix implementation is not, they're not intending to upgrade that in any way. Uh, so that's going to probably stay in this format. Other chains will change to the remark standard. So once we build that to into pallets, we have a half a dozen chains committed to using our our logic natively in their runtime, unless for some reason they, you know, back down on their promise and commitment. What's happening with our logic is that this will be so widespread that you will be able to easily teleport your non-fungibles across different chains. So that's that's pretty cool. But yeah, already there are different implementations that people can target, pursue. I am assuming that most deployments will be on Moonriver because it's the friendliest to the current developer base and because you can just copy-paste stuff over from, from Ethereum, so that's pretty handy. Remark is the sort of logic that's going to be implemented into the, the other networks that are going to have NFTs on Kusama, is that right? Yes. Could you give a, a sort of an overview of Remark then and how it works? Sure. We developed Remark out of our frustration with simple image NFTs. We wanted NFTs to do more, to be more. The problem is that when you're building on chains with established standards, it is very easy to get stuck in those standards. Just last week, or the week before that, I think, two optional fields were merged into the ERC721 standard on Ethereum that define the royalties for NFTs. These fields are, because royalties are completely unenforceable on-chain, you can't force people to pay royalties. Uh, these are voluntary fields that marketplaces should integrate, but don't have to. Adding these two fields that just contain two bits of information, who gets the royalty and how much, took three years to merge. It was a three-year discussion. This is kind of ridiculous to us, and if we wanted to build what we wanted to build on Ethereum, it would have to go through an incredibly arduous bureaucratic process to get that approved and discussed, which we didn't really want, considering the ambitions we had for the, for the project, for the standards. And so what we came up with was a system of NFTs that is basically NFT Legos, which you can put together and build an operating system for, for NFTs. You can build any system of any complexity by putting these Legos together. Our NFTs can contain other NFTs natively, our NFTs can have multiple resources, so you can have like an audio file and a PDF file in the same NFT, and depending on what program you load it in, that's the resource that gets loaded and played to you. You can have NFTs that are emoted on, so you can send reactions to NFTs, and if you follow the standard, they, these will be visible in any UI that implements the remark standards, which is a great social mechanic, but also a great price discovery mechanism. And also, you have reactive NFTs that can then react to these emotes or other on-chain and off-chain values. For example, if I have a digital image of Mona Lisa, people send 50 kissy emojis to Mona Lisa, I can have logic that says if Mona Lisa has more than 50 kissy emojis, show her as blushing. This is a, a function of just multiple resources being available in that one NFT. So there are two resources, one a regular Mona Lisa and the other is a blushing Mona Lisa. And what I tell the NFT is, if the number of kissy emojis is over 50, then just reverse the priority of those resources. And so any interface that implements our NFTs will display the resources by priority and it will automatically load the one that it needs to load. 
And this is actually what we're using live right now. We have a prototype live that people are actually using this on, switching priorities, equipping items, changing the look and feel of the NFTs. Even if you share a link to the NFT to social, its preview image will reflect what that NFT has equipped at that time. These are called Canaria birds. If my Canaria birds has a flower wreath on its head, and then I replace that flower wreath with a helmet and post that to social, it's going to be shown as with the helmet. So it's dynamic NFTs that you can interact with regularly and that you should interact with regularly. It's kind of like a, it kind of evolved into a global MMO where everybody's participating in a huge collectible game that will have an expanded universe. But it's really interesting because it demonstrates all of this functionality from Remark that we're building. So that's really interesting. Twitter is obviously a, a key part of the NFT space in just the communications and the ability to interact with the art and the NFTs, whatever it is that you're buying and selling and in a um, community of. So putting the ability to have emotes and that kind of interaction with the NFT directly on chain and being part of it is going to bring those worlds together and have a more kind of interactive NFT experience, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Not only that, but you can also use these across like these are not just collectibles that look cool because you can edit them a, a bit because we're automatically connected to all of these other chains by launching on kusama we already have an expanded universe on us so we can easily mirror these into moon river to deploy on their version of OpenSea. we can easily pull these into so karura as the DeFi hub of kusama can very easily read people's addresses and check if they have a canaria bird with a karura headband and give them a bonus on their apy or or a lower stability rate on a loan. So we have this expansive universe where these NFTs are automatically available on all the connected chains and through that allow for some gated functionality to exist and to build on for these other teams. So on the, the sort of Kusama version of OpenSea, it will be able to read, you know, all of the Ethereum NFTs that exist. Will, will the marketplaces that are on Ethereum be able to go the other way and read from Kusama and have that kind of interaction that way instead? Not unless they build it that way. But we have planned some bridges. Because these NFTs need to be interacted with very frequently, we can't really port the full functionality of Remark 2.0 onto Ethereum because you can't really afford 100 bucks per emote, right? You can't afford 100 bucks to, to switch the priority of an NFT. Uh, it wouldn't make sense. And so what we're going to do first is build an IOU bridge where you essentially freeze your bird, freeze your NFT, freeze your Remark 2.0 NFT in place in its current state you mint an IOU for it with a static image version, and then you use that on OpenSea and whatever, trade it, and yes, then Ethereum can read it in a static way. But if you want the full functionality back to be able to equip, unequip, and everything else, then you would have to basically send it back, burn it, and then it gets unlocked on the Remark 2.0 side, whatever chain supports it. So that's like a one-way migration? No, it's not one way. You can take it back by you know, unlocking it. You would burn the IOU, and then the locked item on the Remark 2.0 side gets unlocked for you again and sent into your wallet. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's kind of like mint an IOU clone that when you burn it, it your, your original gets unlocked. Okay, all right. So you're bringing all the functionality that, say, async.art already provides on Ethereum, but in a kind of native way. Is that the sort of vision that is going to be the functionality or is it much wider than that? What's the vision for the Lego? The, the vision is to provide the building blocks for people to do things that we can't imagine right now. But really, I just want to see people's imaginations and see what happens, see where they take it. Because these Legos, when you put them together, they can really do something extraordinary. Like w one example is like you mint an empty music sheet NFT. You, the people then mint uh, music notes, they send them into the music sheet, then they collectively decide where each note goes and you end up with a playable NFT that is a music composition that can distribute royalties from the sales to everybody who participated in its creation. And this is natively possible with Remark 2.0 because of our art Legos that can put this together. A, a loot soundtrack would be, would be fairly, <laughs> fairly royalty full, one would imagine. Yep. <laughs> Yep, it would. So like those adventure hymns that just came out, those would do fairly well in terms of composition on Kusama. You would be able to mint more than 32 of them without going broke. <laughs> Whereas on Ethereum, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a uh, fascinating vision. Obviously, Kusama and Polkadot are in their very earliest stages of emerging into the scene. In terms of uh, uh, Remark itself, I understand that there is a a sort of vision for version one and a vision for version two. And there actually um, is, you know, quite a large step between those two, as I understand it. 
So do you want to give us a sense of where things are now and, and where things are going to be in the not too distant? Remark 1.0 is just the regular image style NFTs that we're all used to, plus emotes. So we've had emotes live for a long time and just the images. The way we created these NFT birds, the canary birds, was people were buying eggs that were Remark 1.0 NFTs. They were emoting on them. And then the birds were generated from these eggs based on the emotes that people sent into the eggs. Which means that if you sent, you know, like 10,000 tennis rackets to your egg, there was a high chance that your bird would be born with a tennis racket in its hand. And this was Remark 1.0. What we've launched is Remark 2.0. So Remark 2.0 is live. We are now live. And everything that I listed, so the the NFT Legos, that is Remark 2.0. So we are live. It works. Everybody can actually already start building these systems. But we're not making it easy on purpose because we are still testing with this Canaria proof of concept. So we want to see how people break it, uh, what happens. And this is why it's not on our singular marketplace. So the singular marketplace is still 1.0. Anything that matures, that proves itself in terms of feature stability on Canaria will move over into singular uh, so that anybody else can start playing with, uh, with the remark NFTs. At the same time, we're also building spec 2.1, which will have royalties, bidding, and some other functionality, which we currently do not have. And also at the same time, we're working on a palette version of Remark so that other chains can integrate it and also on a Solidity version so that we can port it over to EVM chains that have uh, little to no users like uh, Polygon, Avalanche and others that are interested in this but have no capacity to build it. So we're, we're going to provide it and we're going to build the bridges to, to move it over there. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the plan for this year. Previously, the sort of the signaling in the space tends to be price-based. You know, you can see an NFT that's you know, garnered a lot of bids and you can get a sense of the sort of the popularity and rarity potentially of particular ones. But Remark has this secondary layer of emotes, which is which is really interesting because it, it gives a second sort of color to the NFT aside from just price. Price is obviously a, a huge factor for these communities, but it, the communities are often richer than, uh, excuse the pun, than just just moving on price. Uh, as we've seen with some of these projects, they can gain, you know, there, there's the there's the meme element to it, which can sort of take it off in other directions aside from just price. So the emote thing is hugely interesting from that perspective because it's it's not costless to to do it, but it's incredibly cheap and it's a uh, the way I understand it, and it can be it can be understood as a tipping thing, but also as a as a sort of a way of of, of signaling your like or dislike or your interest. Talk us a bit around the emotes and how that develops further on, and, and what can be done with it. The emote is is a very interesting. It is interesting as a price discovery method because it lets you uh, gauge the relative value of an NFT versus another NFT of the same type or maybe even appearance. Like we've seen when we were selling these eggs during our our sale a few months ago, when egg eight 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 two was sold, it got thirty thousand emotes overnight, and we were stumped for like twenty four hours. Like, why is this happening? And then we realized that has a meaning in China, and so. That's a very lucky number in China, and this is why it has so many Chinese emotes on it, and this is why people went absolutely berserk for it. And so you have egg 8881 and 8882 next to each other, and 8882 is exponentially more valuable, purely because it has this symbolism in China, which is really interesting. So it worked out great for that, but also there were people who were, like, somebody wanted a certain egg, and then somebody else got it, and then this this guy who missed out went berserk with poop emoji on it. And so he tried to vandalize the the hijacker's egg by by just bombing it with undesirable emo- emotes, which also turned into kind of this fun troll game that later evolved into, into such a frequency that we actually broke Kusama twice with the popularity of the emote feature. So it, it actually, it, it worked out way better than we expected. We have some interesting game mechanics planned for that for, for later on, especially in terms of the conditional rendering and stuff. So I think it's it's something that more protocols should consider if they can make it optimized to store. So we're right now, our storage is kind of cheap because we're not using on-chain storage at all. And so we can afford to to log these emotes onto the chain. But at the same time, we're, we're trying to develop really optimized ways to store them on-chain so that we can move on to pallet logic. And this has also been a very interesting problem because emotes at their core are just unicodes. And unicodes also take up a lot of string data. And so you have to find a way to store those in a very efficient way so that you don't overload the the chain storage and and the full nodes and and whatnot. So it's it's all full of very interesting problems. But I think we're on to something really interesting as a mechanic here, and that I want to explore further. 
how are you going approaching storage then in terms of you know having on-chain storage where, where are you looking to for examples of how to do it and, and how do you think that that will play out for actual content of uh, the nft so for the image data and everything we just use ipfs so ipfs is the proven solution it's going to work we do not use the storage focused chains because I personally don't believe in their longevity. You can you can't go wrong with a protocol. You can definitely go wrong with a chain. There's a lot of money grabbing chain that just don't take scaling into consideration because they think because they have no problems scaling now, they will never have problems scaling. But if they reach the popularity that they're dreaming about, they will absolutely have problems scaling. I focused on IPFS in terms of storing the image data. Uh, so that and that that's that's worked out well. In terms of storing the actual information of the chain right now we're storing it alongside the graffiti alongside the blocks and that this this is not that big of a deal all things considered all the nfts that were ever produced all the emotes that were sent all the i think 600,000 emotes that were sent into the system all the nfts all the hundred thousand or so nfts that we've made so far in our community all of that comes down to around 500 megabytes of text data, which is not bad considering it's text data, and text data is notoriously inefficient. This can be zipped down into like four or five megabytes, um, which is which is quite all right. But for on-chain, it, it becomes a bigger problem. And that's where, for example, for emotes, I've been looking at uh, methods that I used in the past when I was a web developer when when a- and before that, when uh, space was a real consideration, both in RAM and in disk space. For databases, the way to implement the emotes onto palettes, the the way that I'm exploring right now, is actually with bit flags. So you would set a bit for every emote, of uh, for every emote that an account can set, and you would have these sets of 256 possible bits to set in a in a big number. It's a, it's a bit hard to explain like this. It's a bit abstract, but essentially you end up with a hugely optimized uh, way to store a set of submitted emotes per NFT per account that can grow almost indefinitely considering the uh, the usage. And if somebody games around it, because it's spammable to a degree with costs, if somebody games around it, it is easy to re-optimize it and use Substrate's uh, forkless upgrade functionality to re-upload an optimized, like a storage element that saves these emotes in, a, in an op- re-optimized way. So this is easy to recalculate every six months or so and upload a new optimized set and reduce the, the state of the chain by like 50% or so. So it, there, are, there are some interesting methods to explore, but it, it's also like very interesting challenges. When someone's re-optimizing their project, is it possible for them to completely change the project? Well, yeah. If you allow them to change the storage to something they want, to some arbitrary data, then yes, they can they can change what's there. This is why ideally, to in order to upgrade uh, a chain this way, to re- re-optimize its storage, what has to happen is somebody has to run a local script that re-optimizes this, then it produces a WASM blob, a WebAssembly blob that they can upload to the chain, so the chain takes it into account and uploads it into, into, into its own storage. And only if that's valid, then it will be enacted. So what the community should do, the community of a chain, is they should run that optimizer themselves and compare the WASM that they get as output. And if they get the same thing, then it's safe. Then they know the, the uploader hasn't tampered with the, with the WebAssembly. But this is true for, for current upgrades of Kusama and Polkadot as well. So if, for example, tomorrow Gavin uploads a WebAssembly blob that says nobody has any money, I have all the money, unless people check that WASM blob, that it really matches what the code says, it can go through, right? So uh, you should always check the WASM blobs that modify a chain's state. Is that a potential problem that will arise in the future from this? Or or do you think that that will be mitigated by the communities and by the people that are running it? Well, it's a problem when, when you have too much control over a chain. So if you're a person who controls the whole council, or more than half the council, and if you also control the technical committee of a chain, which can expedite certain proposals so that they skip the voting queue, then yes, uh, because you can technically vote something in overnight. But if you don't have such dictatorial power over a chain and the community actually checks your WASM, there's a noticeable delay between a submission of a proposal and its enactment. So there's plenty of time for the community to react, to vote it down, veto it, and remove it from the chain. Plus, uploading a proposal is by no means cheap. 
a proposal, uh, a, a, a WebAssembly blob is like 300 to 400 kilobytes of data, I think even more now, which is very, very expensive in terms of a deposit that you need to make to upload such a big file. And so if the community rejects it, the attacker will, will get financially punished as well in that. So it's, it's all about uh, decentralization and then community diligence after it's decentralized. Yeah. And they're incentivized not to, not to attack if they're going to get uh, mitigated. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So without wanting to add more FOMO to the fire, uh, considering um, if I wanted to get hold of a founder, I'd have to part with about 5 million US dollars currently, according to Canaria. <laughs> Tell us about Canaria itself and the eggs and how they've hatched and just the general sort of thinking around, you know, why you started with this particular element, although obviously you're showcasing what you're doing, but like everything in the NFT space, it takes on a life of its own and, and becomes popular and goes off in different directions. So t tell us a bit about the specific NFT project that Remark started with. Yeah, I think you sorted it by most expensive. So you just, you just have to go to, to a low to high and you'll, you'll find some. Yeah, I, I, I think I can afford 1.2 KSM is, is about floor <laughs> price uh, but, as yeah. far as I can see. But uh, I'm more interested in the higher end stuff. You know me. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that beast with the, with the revenue share trait is, is, is quite, a, quite a good one. The, the Canaria project is our fundraising mechanism that we use to make uh, Remark self-sustainable self as an organization. We started by launching a collection of 10,000 digital eggs that would hatch into birds and that needed to accept emotes in order to hatch into something interesting. So if you didn't have any emotes, you would get a somewhat plain bird without items. It also depended on when you start, when you click the hatch button, uh, how early you bought in, and so on. So we rewarded the early buyers more, and so on. And so we just launched last week, ten days ago or so. We launched the birds, in that you could finally open the eggs and see them evolve. And today we launched uh, the trading for for the birds, so that people can actually trade these items at the hatch. With. So the story is that when you emote on these eggs, you influence the bird's child items and the bird, uh, the bird itself. So if you send a lot of robot emoji, then the bird might be born with some robot parts, but it can also have a toy robot with itself. It uh, just, it's, it's random. The, the catch is that since we have NFTs that can own other NFTs, the, your bird will be born with some other NFTs inside of its inventory that you can equip, unequip, modify, and so on. And so you can actually take that robot toy out into your general inventory of your address, and it's, it's an NFT like any other, and then you can trade it, you can sell it on the open market, or you can buy some other items and put those into your bird and equip them and change its appearance. So you can have this modifiable avatar. You can think of it like buying a hoodie for your, for your CryptoPunk or whatever. And so this is, this is one aspect. The other aspect is that the top 100 birds had secondary art, which we commissioned from around 40 individual artists. All those birds can modify the priority in which this art is shown. So if people flip this to show that custom art first, then you get this beautiful, beautiful image card of a custom drawn bird for that particular card. So that's another bonus there. And so this is basically, these, this Canaria project is essentially a demo of all of this remark functionality shoved into one hole where you have the multi-resource NFTs where you can switch this priority, you have the equipable NFTs, the nestable NFTs, and you have emotes that you can still send onto these birds and emote on them with and, and so on. So far, the, the reaction has been really great. You know, it felt really good to be working on this for eight months and then finally launch it and see absolutely zero people complain. That's <laughs> unprecedented. Everybody was ecstatic about their birds. Because they look they look great and the combinations are truly wild and we are really excited to start building an, an expanded ecosystem around them because one of the staples of all this is that if you have an nft with multiple resources you also have the ability to add new resources to it later so if you're an issuer of a collection like we are of these birds and somebody has birds seven nine one eight for example then i can suggest a new resource for that bird later on and the owner of that bird will get a notification that asks him to accept it. And if they accept, they get a new resource on their bird. And this can be useful for forward compatibility in that I don't have to know in advance all the projects that my birds are going to be compatible with. I can add new resources later after the fact. And so if somebody else builds a 3D game in five years on the blockchain, I can make a 3D version of every bird and then I can suggest those as alternative resources to those bird owners and they can accept those and if they do 
their birds that they already have will automatically become compatible with whatever 3D Minecraft comes out in five five years on the blockchain by whoever built it. And th this is what gives kind of the NFTs like forward compatibility and and forever liquidity, which is really interesting because you, you no longer have NFTs that just sit in your wallet. These are NFTs that you're going to be interacting with regularly, switching out resources, playing them in games, uh, using them in DeFi protocols and so on. So this is kind of um, the idea behind Canary. It's the most complex use case we could think of so that we can demonstrate all of this technology. That's fascinating. So you can sort of get a, a tap on the shoulder further down the road and someone suggests to you, hey, you know, your particular NFT would be super cool in this environment. Come and check it out. So you're participating in the growth of the ecosystem, but the ecosystem is also telling you about what's happening on a sort of interim basis. And you can continue to, you can choose to opt in or not, which could bring you down other wormholes and you find yourself in 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 new ecosystems and new opportunities because of your your sort of initial activity within that protocol sort of you know that 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 project early on it's like sort of nft inception you can you can just you can just continue continue through the wormholes it's very exciting exactly exactly and you also have like you have like for example not everybody's going to have the birds there's there's just under 9000 of them but there's going to be more items than the birds that can equip them. So for example, let's say I have a fireman's axe and that axe has two resources right now, one for the left hand and one for the right hand because they're different visuals. And later on, somebody builds a Minecraft on blockchain. What I can do as the issuer of that axe is I can add a new resource to that axe that's a 3D version of that axe. And that axe automatically becomes compatible with that Minecraft game. And so the items that you have now might be usable in other games later on, even though we are now not aware of any other games that are coming up. So you can expand the scope of those items and of all the NFTs that you own further into the future as new projects arrive. This seems like very important functionality to, to, to be able to reach that vision of the fully interconnected metaverse. Uh, you know, made up of many different projects. It's something that seems to have been overlooked until now. It hasn't really happened until until now. So that's that's really exciting because otherwise you have to you have to run your own site and developers need to do that all all to the side. And and really, it's not actually an interactive NFT that that works. It, it's plugged on afterwards. You know, in a kind of messy way. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right now, right now, you you kind of beholden to any team that builds custom functionality, and if that team disappears, that functionality disappears. So, right now, they kind of force things into other things. Like, for example, if you want to, like the recent loot craze on on Ethereum, if you want to put a loot card into a game, you have to build that game. You have to build a custom parser for that game, and then you have to make the engine react to whatever is in those loot cards in a specific way. But if you disappear, if your UI disappears, your entire, this entire integration disappears because it's not standardized. It, it's not composable on a, on a native level, on a core level, on a raw level from the, from the perspective of the loot cards. All the, all the interactivity, all the added functionality is tacked on on top. It's not, it's not native to it. And so it's very difficult to sustain. So I imagine all of those different loot derivatives will kind of die out, you know, like ICOs in 2017. Everybody's minting, you know, like there's there's dice for loot adventurers, there's creatures for loot adventurers, there's this for loot adventurers. Now there's desires for creatures for loot adventurers and so on. And I expect that most of these will never be heard from again, purely because they rely entirely on their maker. In terms of these hatched chicks or, ha or birds, having these various elements to them clearly there is a a visual that that attaches it and that a visual has to be created by an artist right so surely the, the the bottleneck here is the ability to create the artwork in line with the imagination of the of the crowd um or do you do you do it the other way so that you kind of push the imagination of the crowd by getting the artwork done in particular ways that allow the NFT to kind of move forward in time in various ways. Like, so which way is the pushing happening? The system is open and we have a design template for people to use. So if people want to use a, a new, if, if they want to design a new gun for the bird to hold, they use our template, which helps them place it in the, in the artboard and will make it immediately compatible with the bird. 
And so anybody who who draws that, it's going to be compatible with the bird. However, there's also, Remark 2.0 has also some permissioning logic built in where you have to whitelist a custom collection to be equipable with your NFTs, or you can just set it to open to all if you want. But we did not because we don't want somebody to start minting, you know, a full screen white surface with text, visit my website, this is my site, or go to my OnlyFans and then place that as an equipable into the bird. And then it overrides everything that we have. So to prevent art spam, we, we, we put these limits in place, but anybody who's building a project can modify or remove those limits as well. So that's amazing because then the, it's in the hands of the community in terms of the creativity rather than sort of centralized in the hands of a group of artists to sort of push the direction. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. Exactly. And that's the point. That, that's what gives it this forward, forward compatibility and eternal liquidity that lets people, you know, expand universes on top of it. Well, that, that's certainly a lot to digest. <laughs> I think people can uh, spend a few weeks meditating on that. It's quite a complex project. And in many ways, we saw it as like, in hindsight, it's almost a mistake to go this in depth this fast. Because when I saw what loot became from simple text on background images, you know, it, it really drove the point of choice paralysis home. Like when I start explaining what Remark can do, it can do too much. And so people don't know where to start. And so they, they just don't. Whereas with loot, you plant this seed of an idea and then people are free to go in any direction they want, which is both a blessing and a curse. Like you, so you have this, this army of derivatives that are, that, are, that are going nowhere. But among those, there will be a few gems that will go to a lot of places. So it's a very interesting mechanic, a top-down versus a bottom-up evol evolution of an ecosystem that's going to be very, very fun to see play out. Some of the NFT projects that I've seen emerging recently that have become incredibly valuable, especially if they have a sort of revenue accruing rarer sets, that kind of thing. I am seeing DAOs appear sort of fairly naturally around them so that those very high priced assets could effectively be fractionalized amongst a DAO of sorts. And then sort of people participate in that as a group. What's your view on sort of DAO spinning out around these, these projects? In a sense, that might also help with the complexity because you might have power users that understand the complexity but are bringing in uh, uh, newer users and educating them as, as part of the DAO. It's another facet to this space which is, is potentially fascinating. Are, are you seeing any of that? I mean, it's early days for you, right? But still, there is this sort of uh, DAO layer that, that, that can appear around these projects. Yeah, that's actually a remark 2.5 feature, uh, turning turning tokens into DAOs. And that's that's the one that I've been pitching from the beginning. Like you have the metaverse with, with land, um, which is also coming. And then you own a piece of land, which is a remark 2.0 NFT. Then you buy a billboard, which is a remark 2.0 NFT. Then you equip a billboard in the inside of a land, like you would an item into a bird. And the billboard appears. And then you fractionalize the billboard into community tokens, which people can buy and they then decide what's shown on the billboard. So if the corporations come in and see high traffic around the billboard, they say, we got to have an ad up there, but it is up to them to bribe the community now to pick their ad in instead of their competitions. And so you have community-based virtual real estate governance uh, built in at the protocol level through these NFT Legos. We already saw actually some like bastardized version of DAOed NFTs where for some of the founder birds, uh, people actually joined into multisigs that now own those birds. And since our founder birds also distribute revenue of the project, they now share the revenue. So, so the revenue will go to the multisig and then they will, it's up to them to, to divvy it out. So it kind of works. We don't have smart contracts, but people find the, found a way around it with, with multisigs and, and stuff like that. I guess as the as the depth and complexity of the Kusama eco ecosystem expands, the depth and complexity of Remark and what people can do with it also expands because of the interoperability of the chains. Yep. This is like NFT university. Yeah. <laughs> it's like course one, like here's an egg. <laughs> and you, you graduate with like metaverse DAOs of which you're fractionalizing billboards together. I mean, like, <laughs> that's what you write your <laughs> yeah, dissertation yeah. on. I love it. Yeah, and I'm happy to report that 99.7% graduated from the first course of hatching. There were actually 180 eggs unhatched, and they've, they've now become rotten eggs, which on their own have become rare collectibles. So even though the birds died in them, they are now going for 10 KSM 
uh, or so. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> I love it because you you even when you mess it up, you're left with something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, dude, you're left with more in this case. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a five x return, so not bad. Will Remark move to Polkadot from um, Kusama? Yes, but not in this format. So we're not going to be redeploying this hacky way on Polkadot. I mean, we, we could already, somebody else could already just switch the endpoint and it, and it already works, but it, we don't want to. Because by the time Polkadot has parachains, we will have pallets, and then those pallets will be included in the parachains that are connecting to Polkadot. So it won't be necessary. Well, where can people find out more? What are the resources? Our Twitter feed, basically. It's at Remark App, RMRK APP. We post everything there, all the announcements, everything. And we have a Telegram chat uh, at t.me canaria underscore official. So that's where people can come in to talk about the birds or just generally the evolution of the project. We also have a newsletter if people want to chime in on that. That's on news.nft.review. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming and chatting to us. Super interesting. Yep. Our minds are blown. Hopefully all our listeners' minds are blown too. Yeah, definitely get you back on as as the metaverse expands and the weird and wonderful things that we can all do with Remark um, begin to blossom. So yeah, listen, thanks so much for all of that. We'll ha have you back on again soon. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>